Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Melbourne and I am the director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at SOU. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, you may type those into the chat or save them for the end. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest, Jerry Andrzejczak, who is participating in our online exhibition titled, What Needs to be Said? Haley Ford Fellows in the Visual Arts. The exhibition brings together the 13 artists who have received the Haley Ford Fellowship in the Visual Arts between 2014 and 2016, an award given annually to artists living in Oregon that is based on accomplishment, depth of practice, and future potential. Jerry is a professor of art at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. For the last 25 years, she has created architectural installations and artists' books based on medical and genetic information to explore personal and political issues. Each piece results from a lengthy collaboration with scientists and medical researchers with the goal of producing work that incorporates and, and comments on medicine, genetics, and ethics. She has had over 40 solo exhibitions internationally and is the recipient of several grants and residencies, including an individual artist fellowship from the Ford Family Foundation, the Oregon Arts Commission, Individual Artist Fellowship, University of Washington Genetic Medicine Commission, NASA at the Johnson Space Center, the Houston Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and an NEA exhibition support grant. Residencies include UNESCO artist in residence Amon Jordan and Mar uh, Marne Sur Saint France, Gasworks London, Momentum artist in residence, and the Max Planck Archive in Berlin, Germany. Her recent, so her recent US exhibitions include the Haley Ford Museum at Willamette University in Salem, Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in Eugene, Cornish College of Arts and King Street Station, both in Seattle, Washington, Evergreen College Gallery in, in Olympia, Washington, Idaho's Boise Art Museum, Florida International University in Miami, and the University of Houston in Texas, with many international exhibitions in Chile, Germany, England, and Israel. Her work has been collected by the Portland Art Museum, Johns Hopkins University, MIT, Sinefi Genzyme, the University of Washington Department of Medical Genetics, and Florida International University. Her current projects include Becoming You, a book showing the process of human fertilization, gestation, and gene genetic testing, testing. Written by bioethicist Dr. Shizu Takahashi with images by Jerry Andrzejczak to be published in Japan in 2022, and a commission from Kura Oncology in Boston to make a cast glass installation of chromosome paintings. She received her BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and MFA from the University of Washington. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Andrzejczak. Hi, Jerry, you're on mute right now. Hi, everybody. How are you doing Hi. today? Fine. And how are you doing in these pandemic times? Uh, it's been interesting and certainly uh, feeding my work in a very different way, realizing how important genetic research is to curing the, <laughs> or finding the virus, right? So yeah. that's been interesting. But yeah, very difficult time for all of us. And thank you for taking time to have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to hearing more and learning more about your work. I did make you a co-host, so you can feel free to share your screen whenever you are ready. Okay, I'll go ahead and do that right now. And uh, again, thank you all for coming today. And I'm sharing this, let's see here. And go to the projection mode. So. Um, one of the difficulties with the PowerPoint uh, and a Zoom lecture is that I'll have to read from my notes that are beside me here. Um, the work that I will show today is the result of collaboration with researchers and hours of labor in the studio. I, as Scott just mentioned, I work with scientists not to repeat the empirical evidence that they find, but to reflect on the formation of life, mortality, identity, and ethics. 
I begin with this film clip of my work, Cellular of Gestation, or the formation of a single cell into a fetal form, because it is the most vital moment in the life of any creature. Two factors, genetics and the environment, determine the ability for this cluster of cells to survive. And with the hand of man in the mix, the environment and now genetic code, we can vastly change this. This is a DNA sequencer, and it was the one used to finally finish the genetic code that was done in 2003. I happened to be in London at the time as an artist in residence at Gasworks, and it was a very influential moment, not only for all of us, but personally, uh, because I had already experienced genetic anomalies in my own family, this was a watershed and made me begin to think about what we could learn and know about our bodies. As a result, I began to make work in direct relationship and in labs with scientists. And I'll show you three projects that I did in the early 2000s. The first is called DNA Fingerprints. This is a work based on an Arabic rug loom. The Patriot Act was passed in 2001 and being married to an Arab American, we paid attention to this. Fingerprints now done with DNA could be taken and kept on file of any Amer Arab American accused of illegal activity. And you'll see in the work that I have in this exhibition that fingerprints and handprints come up quite a bit throughout my work history. So I hired a student of mine, Benjamin Duncan, who is now a doctor at the University of Washington, to assist me in making DNA fingerprints of my husband's family, my husband, his father, his two brothers, and my son. So this is the notebook that Benjamin kept at the time. And I ended up making silk prints of each one of the gels that were made of their DNA fingerprints and then sewed through them to connect the markers from my son to his grandfather to his uncles. And you could see the family line was very clear. The, their markers were all the same with some uh, you know, differences, but it was pretty interesting to see. My next project, again, with another student researcher, it's really great teaching at Reed because I get these really interesting students walking into my class. Um, she had begun to work at the Center for Disease Control and was working on herpes B. At the time, this was the only known virus that carried from a mother to be a genetic mutation on the child. And she showed me her research on a visit and said that she was willing to collaborate with me. So what I did was I made, again, a silk print of that genetic testing and you have of the mother, the child at the end, and in the middle, the marker that is determining the um, herpes B. Although I had no uh, connection with herpes B, I did lose a child because of a genetic anomaly that was passed through my family. And it was also the anomaly that had killed my mother. So it was, or you know, caused my mother to die. So it was very important to me to think about how genetics and uh, family history get tied together, what we have and what we lose that actually form us in a very important way. So I set up an embroidery table much in the way that a 17th century uh, labor embroidery table would be made in Southeast Asia and the threads were hung above. Um, these are three of my lovely students who were helping me to sew this project. Um, the project was shown several places and in each iteration, I invited people to come sit at the table and also sew into, um, I, I saw the parallel between what my student was doing in the lab at the Center of Disease Control, just testing and testing and testing over and over and over again in this kind of fine work of embroidery and repair being uh, having a similarity. The third project that I did in direct connection to this discovery was a bit later. And this is a map of migration of human beings, through, well, of men in particular, but human beings uh, done by Spencer Wells. Starting in the 90s, he was researching the Y chromosome to see the origins of where people come from. So you can see here, Adam pointed to here, and the marker M168, which every male has on their Y chromosome, this number sequence. And the subsequent number sequences are the migration and mutation of the Y chromosome. Uh, you can see the timeline on the base here. So I created a installation for what was the Oregon College of Art and Craft. It had a beautiful atrium in it. And this installation entitled M168 Tracing the Y Chromosome consisted of large Muslim panels and small books that were like um, prayer books up against a wall. 
I was very interested in this metaphorical map of humankind and each one of those layers kind of symbolizing the different markers that would be on a Y chromosome. And it is kind of a portal. So uh, you could stand in the middle of it and kind of look up to the top. And in the top is the genetic code and the M168 number. This was the companion piece with this were books that were aligned on the wall and each one was de dedicated to a different uh, marker, different number marker. So all either began or ended with M168 and then went through all of the markers that every, uh, every generation and migration marker of a male Y chromosome. It was all letterpress printed blind so that the, it's only embossed. And it's the entire genetic code that was in here. Again, going back to being in London at the Wellcome Trust and seeing the DNA sequencer, they also put together uh, large books of the entire genetic code. So I was very inspired by that exhibition. Uh, so I come back to this project that I started with in um, from 2008 to 2009, I worked in Steve Black's laboratory here at uh, Reed College, and I created this film. It's a 12 minute film of gastralization, and it's actually a spider egg that gestates and then um, implodes and then gestates. So it's sort of showing there's multiple eggs that a spider creates, of course, and only a very, very small percentage that survive. So the project was very much about observing this in the laboratory and also making a film that's a loop that mimics this um, process of survival. And the survival, as I said, uh, in testing these, the laboratory was discovering some of them aren't surviving because of too much to too many toxins in the air. Some of them had genetic anomalies and they didn't survive. And it's just in some ways what they're doing in a laboratory and even studying spider eggs is sort of similar to what's happening with human beings all the time. Some of us live longer than others and some of us don't get to live. Uh, so, uh, and then some, you know, go on to a very uh, full bodied life. Uh, in addition to doing the film, uh, this was part of an exhibition that traveled as well. And um, the chart here is sort of the, the main events <laughs> of gestation. So you see this coming along and you begin to see the legs of the spider form. I distinctly cut the film over and over again before you saw it as what it was going to be. I didn't want people to focus on what it was coming to be, but that it was symbolic for becoming in general. Um, you, and they study spider eggs because of course they're out of, you know, they're not um, in a sack. So they're just, you can see them, they have a kind of clear film that's around them. This piece was also then paired with another work called Soundwall. And this was a, pro a project that I worked with Andrew Pelling uh, he's uh, at UCLA, he's a biophysicist. At the time he was at UCLA. Um, and UCLA has this amazing uh, art and science department where they uh, openly collaborate with artists. Uh, Andrew recorded the sounds of cells dividing. He was recording the vibration of yeast cells to understand how cancer cells divide and sound differently. And this uh, sonic technology has, be, has been used over and over again. It's particularly effective in determining uh, cells from lung cancer. So um, when cells are uh, have an anomaly in them, a genetic anomaly, and are dividing like cancer cells, they actually sound like uh, the screeching wheels of a train on a train track. Whereas when they're uh, dividing healthily, they sound pretty smooth. So I do have a film of this uh, project with the, the spider egg dividing and the sounds of the cells. I, 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 for time's sake, I won't show you the film today, but uh, it is up on my website. And this project, what I did was I made handmade paper panels that were four by eight feet. Um, it's abaca paper, so very thin. And then I embedded the speakers into it so that this round room uh, kind of vibrated as the sound was uh, emanating through. So again, different sounds of different cells moving. And it also was kind of a shadow play kind of space. 
And this is it installed at the Portland Art Museum. Um, the piece first was made for the artist residency in marnay sur saint France, outside of Paris. The project, when I put it in the Portland Art Museum, it was uh, accompanied with another project that I made specifically for the museum and it's called Case Study. So you see this case on the floor here. This is all 23 chromosomes uh, wrapped up and there's scrolls on the wall. So I took three of them out. Um, at the time I was working at the University of Washington, I worked at the University of Washington with researchers from 2009 to 2011. And I was working on a project that I'll show in a minute, um, doing the history of uh, medical genetics. But as a result, I was able to go into Peter Bauer's laboratory and he showed me his mini fridge filled with genetic samples of people. And I was sort of stunned by this idea that uh, he was documenting somebody's entire body in genetics and storing it so that they could do comparative analysis between different peoples. Um, and he studies um, soft cell uh, disorder and some other things. So it was specific uh, research. Uh, so I based this box that I made uh, on the floor, both as a uh, based on a Torah case uh, with scrolls in it, but also the mini fridge that I saw in the laboratory. And what's documented on here is my family's history. So I did a lot of research and questions of uh, my all both sides of my own family and then my husband's family. So in a way, I guess it's, you know, like a piece of research for um, our children to to have and look at. So this is a close up of that. And the markers were again, embroidered and uh, enumerated and translated. So when you get a genetic test done, it'll give you a number and a code, and then you can figure out what that means by looking it up. The National Institute of Health actually has a website that you can look those things up. This is the project that I completed for the University of Washington. And this is Arno Matofsky in front of it. Arno uh, is the father of medical genetics. He's also a Holocaust survivor and was really influential to me and uh, very important in our conversations over the years. I was hired by them in 2009 to make a work that would commemorate Arno's work at the University of Washington. And uh, he did not want a portrait. He did not want information on him, but wanted to share publicly for people who were going to have genetic testing done at the University of Washington, a space for them to know what some of these things might look like. So this is chromosome number 17, which is the uh, chromosome that has the marker for breast cancer. And Mary Catherine King, who was Arno's student, discovered that marker at the University of Washington. So we used that image Again, uh, an image that we made in the laboratory there. And then I augmented it quite a bit with color and embroidering into it. Um, I embroidered all of the genetic code that comes down the center of this. Uh, the, so this text is all embroidered and then etched on the glass, different um, uh, important pieces of knowledge about how genetics and chromosomes work. And what Arno is pointing to is epigenetics, which is really his crowning uh, glory. At the end of his career, he had figured out that epigenetics, which means that your genetics uh, of your body get influenced by the environment that you're in and other aspects of your life, like stress <laughs> or history. So he was really um, interested in that given his own background. So this is a close up of that project. And I don't do public projects so often, but um, I have since that time uh, been commissioned by several other institutes to do projects. And this is one I did recently for the University of West Virginia's Medical Cancer Research Center in Berkeley. Um, this is chromosome number two, which is um, responsible for protein production and proteins have a lot to do with how well your cells divide and how healthy they remain. So really good connection to that. So um, it's a window. It's like a stained glass window if that's, uh, yeah. Um, so working with the University of Washington, I became very close friends to a genetic counselor named Robin Bennett. And um, 
we started talking about doing a project together um, on chromosome painting. Um, chromosome painting is actually a laboratory test in which they inject phosphorescence into chromosomes and they turn striped colors. So I essentially took that laboratory image that's squiggly chromosomes and lined them up and uh, made them a graph. So kind of a minimalist uh, interpretation of that genetic test. But I kept the percentages and color uh, in the way that you would find in a geneticist's laboratory. So very similar tests are done all the time that Robin was giving me and we were talking through. Um, so this was done at the Kirkland Art Center and then traveled to Israel for an exhibition as well as a few other places. Uh, and in both cases, both in, with the University of Washington in Seattle and then in Israel, the piece has been used for talking about genetic anomalies and translocation. Um, so what you're seeing with the uh, markers is that there's these purple pieces that will trace throughout and it's literally markers getting when your cells divide and your chromosomes break and reassemble, sometimes little pieces get lost and put onto other chromosomes. So each one of these I dedicated to a different uh, cancer. And uh, so um, again, as I said before, number 17, you can find the marker for breast cancer. Number six here, you find the marker for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So if you have genetically inherited one of those cancers, you will find it on that marker specifically. Uh, so what we did was we then produced uh, scarves <laughs> of these panels and sold those to raise money for people to have free genetic testing. Is in 2012 when this piece came out, it was still really controversial. And the genetic counselor, Robin Bennett, that I've been working with, uh, was very, it's very concerning that people, when they do have a genetic anomaly, are afraid to have that test and also contribute to us understanding it. So this was a way around the insurance system, <laughs> literally. Um, we raised about $30,000, which meant that uh, quite a few people were able to have free tests. Uh, Robin also gave uh, uh, several talks, but uh, one was televised in which uh, Brian St. Jack was uh, having the genetic test done live <laughs> on television and uh, she gives him the results of that test. So it was kind of an odd way for one's work to be out there in the world, but there we are. Um, this project is, um, I'm doing a similar kind of project with Cura Oncology right now. And they are a very advanced genetic research institute that specifically makes medication or therapies for people according to their genetic uh, dispositions. So using genetic testing again, and we're working with some chromosome painting. These are light boxes that the scarves were displayed on. Um, the next event was pretty interesting. I was contacted by Dr. Alexander Stern from the University of Michigan. And she studies eugenics and the connection to genetics. Uh, knew Arno Matowski and um, Arno's work in understanding genetics was also part of this book. Eugenics Nation is really an expose of the way in which Americans have uh, inherited racist behavior via um, the eugenics movement, which was very strong and practiced in the United States from, two, from 1900 to 1987. And in fact, in Oregon, we use some eugenics practices in our prisons and orphanages, sterilizing people who we saw as having genetic anomalies that were unfit. Um, and Governor Kitzhaber, which is in the very beginning of this book, asks forgiveness to all those who had uh, been sterilized. Um, in 2001, he asked forgiveness. So this is a book that Alexander published in 2014. I did the cover for it. And then I spent the next year doing research with Alexandra into the Gates skin color chart. Not so much that I wanted people to practice using the Gates skin color chart, but to kind of show that our skin is actually a combination of melalin and phenomelalin. And our skin is actually not white or black, but a multitude of colors. So people have different levels of melanin in their skin and then uh, their skin has different tones to it. And 
we know that skin gets darker with lots of exposure to light. That's the melanin being exposed to light. This is an installation that was made for the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. They're steel boxes and they're silks from um, the Middle East. So they're silks that are all from the Silk Road. Again, the Silk Road is probably one of the most important uh, genetic mix uh, <laughs> tool that happened. So not only did goods travel from Asia through Europe and overseas, but also human beings. And then of course our genetic quality. So you can see that the spread of humans uh, around the world and of, of course a variety of skin colors that come from that, uh, that origin. But the Gates skin color chart was something that really shocked me that she features as a chapter in her book. And this uh, doctor, Renegold Gates, came up with a skin color chart so that if you uh, went to adopt a child, you would use the skin color chart to determine if the child would be, uh, what color they would be. And of course, if they had any kind of a negroid tone to them or a uh, bodily features, they would not be allowed to be adopted by a white family. Uh, this is a picture from 1957 and this practice went on well into the 1980s throughout the United States. So it's something that really kind of uh, shocked me that this would be used. The actual skin color chart that um, Gates was using, he based on one done by the anthropologist, the Austrian anthropologist Van Lucien, who did this in 1860, he traveled the world gathering different tones of skin uh, and are taking, <laughs> making samples of different tones of skin. So sort of revealing, um, you know, a pre-national socialist uh, behavior that was pretty ingrained worldwide about you know, racial hierarchies. And um, I was, you know, really interested in people being able to walk through and then take on these different tones to their skin. Um, I was really interested in having these uh, rather minimalist boxes, uh, you know, this idea of kind of trying to frame things, categorize things, but in fact, they're so overlapped and overlayered that you can't completely separate one from the other. So a cluster. And this is a picture of how the light moved through the silk. I hand dyed the silk with different uh, natural dyes mostly barks. And um, as you can see, somebody inside the piece was a really important aspect to the project. Uh, at this point, uh, I had a sabbatical from Reed and a lot of the work that you're seeing really is because of sabbaticals, uh, <laughs> I'm able to make work. We teach a lot at Reed College. Um, so I applied for uh, a residency in Berlin, knowing I really wanted to go to the Max Planck. And this is also from my relationship with Arno. Arno is from Dresden, Germany. And uh, of course we had many conversations. My family is from Germany, um, I'm Czech, and uh, I have Holocaust survivors in my own family. So we had conversations about this and the Max Planck archive holds the Kaiser Wilhelm archive and the Kaiser Wilhelm archive has all of the biometric data archives that were made during and after World War II. So I went specifically, uh, first of all, Momentum is an artist residency program. And what they do is they help you find, they give you housing and then they help you get your connections with uh, research institutes that you wanna be working with. So that was my project. And, uh, I, I was able to get into the Max Planck and into their archives and found this man, George Geipel, who was taking the biometric data of uh, people in Berlin. And what they still have is not uh, anyone who's Jewish, but people who were just normal citizens. And they had, you know, kind of cleaned out their archive. But what I learned is that George Geipel had taken the biometric data handprints only uh, and fingerprints of people and uh, came up with a numeric system to measure the lines. And this is the project that if we had the exhibition in Ashland, this is the project that would be there. I created nine different books. This is my studio in Berlin. 
Um, so you're looking at tables with the book pages open. Uh, part of the program is also having an open studio. So I had people come through, had an opening, et cetera. So Momentum is also a gallery, but then hosts these events elsewhere. On the back wall, you're seeing one of the first DNA fingerprints. And I have a fingerprint over top of that. And it's of a mother and her four children. So you have all of these uh, uh, markers, again, lining up to see that first DNA fingerprint that was done by Alex Cox in, um, at the Wellcome Trust. So what Geipel was doing was he was taking the handprints of people and he was particularly interested in twins and coming up with a numeric system to measure this. What mostly stunned me about this was that we still use this. In fact, when you put your hand down, when you come in from another country, your biometric data is being taken and a set of numbers and code are put down into documenting your presence. We're also having our eyes photographed and our face cages photographed so that you're becoming numeric code. But Geipel's the guy who came up with this idea of our lines, our hands, our shapes, these forms would become this numeric code. So I literally photographed the archive while I was there. And I have all of the names of the people who were in the archive. I then wrote to many, many of them because many of them were still alive. He continued to do this until 1960. Um, and twins, a lot of twins in Berlin took part of the study. And I was pretty sure that none of them would have known that they were part of the discovery of biometric data or being, you know, their research was being used this way as a result. And in fact, I got letters back and they did not know. <laughs> um, and in a couple of cases, um, they allow me to use their names, but I have not put any names to any of the work, though I know who, you know, I know the names of the people, right? But I, but to um, honor their privacy, I have not put their names with them. Um, so this is his system. I don't want to go into it too far because that would take too long. But um, the other thing that I discovered in doing this is I've been very, very interested in gestation and um, origins of identity. And I learned that your hand and fingerprints are actually coming from that very early gestation stage in which the two, the cell, the single cell divides into two. And it's the pacing of that division that begins to create the textures and surfaces that are unique and the forms in our bodies. So it's literally timing. <laughs> timing of cell division gives us our unique qualities. And the other thing I discovered was that honestly, none of us have the same exact anything. We all have hands and feet and it's all miraculous, but they're all completely and totally unique, including the lines on our hands. We do see similarities in twins. We do see similarities in parents and children, but none, none of us are exactly the same. There's no carbon copying, um, which is why, you know, genetic engineering is both um, important and scary. <laughs> that um, So I was really interested in photographing these and also kind of tracing their lines and this beauty of these hands and the beauty of the lines that are on them um, and sort of honoring these people in a way of um, for for all also offering uh, the other one of the sets is just of twins and uh, with identical twins you can see how closely related their handprints are that also really was incredible to me um, and as I said, this is the uh, DNA fingerprint of the mom and the children and a close up. This is done on linen and then a, a film that's laid on top. And then this is a textile of that same print. Um, I, I really love working with textiles as you could see in much of my work. So this is a repeat block of this over and over again. I was thinking about generations. Um, and as I said, part of the residency was also to give a tour talk, you know, uh, about the work. And I see that as a really important part of my work. I think of my work as, uh, as a way to have a conversation about these really difficult to understand phenomena of genetics, but also of, um, uh, of their importance and maybe even uh, why we should be why we should know about them because they're going to be used so often. Um, 
coming back to the US, I had a show at Evergreen and decided I'd make a piece for it. Um, and this is called mtDNA, which is mitochondrial DNA that is found just in women. And uh, they had in 2016, another article was published that Robin, my genetics friend, <laughs> genetic counseling friend gave to me. And it traces the uh, mtDNA throughout the world and shows the different um, types of cultures that have different types of mitochondrial DNA and made this beautiful chart of it. And I decided to make a mushrabia, which is or a, a screen, a shows you screen. Mushrabias are in the Arab world. And uh, I had a, a, also spent some time in Jerusalem. My husband's family is from Jerusalem as well as the exhibition I had had. Um, and these are kind of the screen porches in the uh, in that part of the world. So I made one out of cedar and then again dyed silk to make this chart. And it's based on this mitochondrial chart in which they assign different colors to different groups of people. So seeing um, this beautiful chart of mitochondrial DNA. And this is sort of the equivalent of the M168 project I made of male chromosomes. This was showing the tracing of female genetics throughout the world, kind of finding Eve, that kind of concept, I guess. Uh, this is the piece completed, and uh, as you can see, it's one long screen, but I've also shown it as a, a space put together. Uh, again, you could see it from both sides, and I really thought of it as an architectural project. Um, I'm sorry, I just need to turn the pages here. <laughs> Um, I took a, a turn in making work this uh, after working on that long project um, back to teaching a lot and um, became very interested in the way in which biometric data is being used worldwide to trace family members and to track people and also to see uh, genetic qualities. And the other thing that I was doing when I returned from Berlin was I began to volunteer for the Syrian refugees who had just arrived and I got to know them pretty well. So I'll show you the next two works. The first is biometric data and which I took, um, as you might guess, my husband's Palestinian and I'm part Jewish. So that's kind of a loaded family combination. Um, I took our biometric data from our photographs. I created a program with one of my students to take and make the face cages for each one of the old photographs that I had. And then I took some of those qualities. So in these books here, this is uh, one of the, the photographs, photograph of my mom. And I have underneath it, the on trace paper, the face, the face design cage. But instead of using these to uh, identify, I just found one of the qualities, the shape of the nose bridge that seemed to be super common in my family and the shape of the eye in my husband's family. And I used that pattern over and over again on top like a quilt. So this is all printed and sewn silk. It's a giant quilt. And then these are sewn lines on top. So sort of this web work that connects all of us together on the top surface. And this is a close up of the cage. This is a close up of their, the books. At this stage, when I photographed this, they were still pinned. I did sew it all together. And then I did another project uh, at the same time. So I really like working with my hands, as you can see, and working slow and uh, over time. This is called white work. And what I did was I purchased a lot of uh, antique linens um, at thrift stores and various, uh, actually a store going out of business here in Portland. And I hand embroidered their names in Arabic on each one of them as a kind of honoring. Um, white linens were used in the Catholic church, particularly around Lent, which is right now. And um, white work is this highly skilled embroidery of embroidering white on white. And it's pretty hard to do um, because your eyes kind of get crossed in, in doing it. But I chose to um, do them on sets of napkins of family members that are related. So this is all one family of four kids that are all related. Sometimes there's two names on them. 
Uh, I also embroidered welcome onto them. At the same time, I had a class of mine. Uh, I teach material objects and um, which includes clay. I had the class make platters because it was the first Thanksgiving that this group of people were in uh, Portland. So we made platters with the word in Arabic welcome on, the, on them. So uh, this also became kind of a book edition. The quilt piece that I showed you all packs up into a box, um, similar to the handprint piece that was going to be at the museum in Ashland. Uh, so I'm really interested in this idea of making sets that are all condensable. So this is one of the embroideries close up. And I didn't show some of that earlier work of uh, the scrolls, et cetera, but all of that is also hand embroidered. So embroidery has been a big part of my uh, life and projects. Um, another project that I started after was I had my own genetic inheritance uh, done and my husband's and my son's. And to, uh, much to my surprise, I found out that I am 53% Iberian uh, Sephardic. So that was really shocking. And then 32% Eastern European. Uh, but it was just fascinating for all of us to see these um, charts. And what um, geneticists have come up with are colors to symbolize different genetic qualities. So I use those colors and they're printed on silk. And I made these silk panels the size of our bodies. So, you know, mine is just five foot <laughs> long. And I, uh, the 53% Iberian is the fuchsia at the top. The 32 Eastern European is the red. And then I have some other uh, Central Europe, et cetera. But my point is that I got very interested in equivocating the color systems of um, genetics to the size and scale of my body. And this is my husband's. And again, the project was displayed um, and one was hung, one was laid, and then there was a scroll, a case made for them to hold them. Um, this brings me to a more recent uh, projects that really relate to the book project I'm working on right now. I hope I'm doing okay with time. Uh, and uh, this is a project that I worked on in 2018 to 2019 with the U.S. Embassy from Santiago, Chile. And it was called ASK, um, Arts, Science, Knowledge Building in the 21st Century. And what we were commissioned to do by the embassy was over a two year period to travel to Chile and then to Friday Harbor Marine Biology Lab and meet together with artists and scientists and talk about how we can visualize some of the genetic or uh, phenomenological <laughs> things happening in the natural world and how we can show people what's going on. So I took uh, a real interest in the rising temperatures in our waterways here in the Pacific Northwest and that making our fish eggs more vulnerable. And one of the reasons our salmon population is decreasing is that in fact, the waters are too warm for them to survive through to full gestation. So again, my obsession with gestation. So I spent that summer in uh, the lab here, did some traveling uh, with the embassy, then the lab here, and then went up to Friday Harbor. But I made a film here in the labs at Reed of this fish egg developing and warming the temperatures and seeing like how well they survive in their the absolute perfect conditions and made films of this you know emergence and so the film is uh you're watching a clip of it here <laughs> um shows that full development and then in some cases it's developed into a fish in some cases it doesn't make it because of the warming temperatures. But I kind of felt like I, I wanted somehow to show people this, this is real, you know, and the, um, the other part of the project. So there was a film and there's a handmade book and I printed the film stills on silk so that when the book collapses, you see the overlap of each image, one on top of the other that kind of unfurls in there. And, um, uh, then, of course, a text that explains what's going on in the waterways. So each one of us as artists or scientists came up with a project and all of this was shown uh, in 
Santiago and in Chile in 2019, 2020, excuse me, it was in 2020. And then the show was closed because of the pandemic <laughs> as everything has been, um, yeah. The project I'm working on right now, uh, I've been at this one also for a couple of years and you kind of get the picture that I work on things for a really long time. Um, and this book I'm doing in collaboration with Shizuko Amai, uh, Tak Takasaki. And what's really interesting here is that Shizuko was actually my first thesis student at Reed College. Shizuko came from Japan and studied biology at Reed and then stayed for an extra year to do a second degree in studio art. And we worked together. And uh, she did a series of paintings, very interested in um, organic form. Her work was very abstract. She returned to Japan, became a doctor. We were in correspondence to some degree. And then she showed up at my, literally at my office. Shizuko runs a fertility clinic in Japan. And in Japan, they do not um, test for so many gene genetic qualities or anomalies of their, their um, uh, eggs as they are developing as we do in the United States. And it's a question of ethics in Japan as to if you see some, some egg, an egg that's developing and has an anomaly, should we be eliminating all of them? So it's a really important ethical question. In addition to running the, the fertility clinic, uh, Shizuko also teaches uh, bioethics at Yale every summer. So that's why she was in the United States. And it was really her background in bioethics that propelled us to do this book. She'd seen my work over the years and um, what I've been doing, we've made 30 different uh, plates for the book. Uh, I've been given the films of in vitro fertilization. So one set of images is of all of the stages. So these are directly from her work. I colorize them, I hand paint them, um, I printed them on silk and then I've made them into works that are then photographed. If this, there's lots of processing that's going on here. You're seeing uh, my colorization of the films. The films are in black and white. Uh, and uh, where we're at with this book, Becoming You is the title of it. And it is a book for adults and children, but written in a way so that kids can understand literally where they come from. And instead of having cute illustrations of here you are as a baby, um, here you are as, the, as you are developing from the very earliest stages because Shizuko believes that we really are, you know, really needing to understand genetics from a very early age and not to be afraid of the knowing what's going on. Um, so it's been a lot of fun working with Shizuko. But again, just like everything else, the book was pretty much prepared by March of last year. Um, I was to go in May for the summer, to spend the summer in Japan, and we were going to print the book, but all of the print houses have been closed and they're still closed. <laughs> so we're still hopeful that we'll get this book done and um, it will be uh, a rather large format book so that the images can be you know, a fairly big, um, palette to look at. The project is also was slated to be at the Women's Studio Workshop and a book made, an artist book edition made. Um, I was to have a solo exhibition of these prints, um, hand painted, silk painted pieces. Um, and that we hope will open this fall because it was to open this past October. So that's that story. Um, so a couple more images of this. Um, what, what's really amazing is that we were able to get like every single moment of development to full gestation. And this is the end sheets of the book, which are photographs of sperm, which we absolutely loved putting together. Um, and that's all, everything I have to show you. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions uh, and yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> If you'd like, you can uh, stop sharing your screen now. Perfect. Okay. And um, if anybody at home has any questions, if you would like to type them into the chat, I am happy to read them aloud. You are also able to um, unmute yourself and ask Jerry directly. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, 
watching it. Hi, hi. I just, I just want to say that was very lovely and really inspiring. I don't actually have a question, but I, no, really, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was, it was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I always appreciate that. Uh, it's kind of um, odd work. And um, most artists don't work in this way. And uh, in some ways, I don't even know if, if I'm <laughs> an artist with a capital A. <laughs> oh, I guess like, so. maybe I'm just a, a lab rat. <laughs> I, I don't know, Jerry. You know, we like to say, you know, to put that A in STEAM for science, technology, engineering, <laughs> art, and mathematics. Yes. Um, you know, the Shenanigan Museum being part of a university, we are very much connected to academic groups yeah. and love uh, to make those connections. Uh, but I, I also I do understand and agree that uh, today there are not many artists who are inspired by sciences and technology or, or mm -hmm. engineering. And it's very wonderful to see how um, those connections can be made and the visual uh, works that can be produced that really helps, I think, broaden that sp spectrum and understanding to a greater audience. Mm -hmm. um, anybody with any questions at home? A question. Um, hi, I missed the I missed the beginning of your talk, so you may have spoken about this, but um, I was curious about your um, like your science background and what you like what was required of you doing this work to to be in a lab, you know, and mm -hmm. just like that technical process of like filming, you know, filming something through a microscope and like you know what your learning process was like to, so that you could get the images that you needed. Yeah, um, honestly, it's very little science background. I went to Carnegie Mellon, which was an institute of technology and very influenced by that. Um, probably I should have studied biology, um, but really what happened for me is personal. Um, I lost a child due to a genetic anomaly and my mother had died of a cancer. So when that happened, I had to spend a lot of time with genetic counselors. And through that connection to the genetic counselors, I realized the importance of all of this. And it's sort of the personal deep dive that I had to do and then made friends with these people. And so all of the science I'm doing is really not my science, it's theirs. And um, I'm sort of their eyes in a way. Um, and I've been lucky that uh, I had students that were willing to work with their kooky art professor that wanted to come and stand over top of them or come do the DNA fingerprints of my family. <laughs> you know, um, so that's been kind of lucky. And uh, we do have this beautiful lab here at Reed and a tech that has trained me to use the electron microscope as well as the magnetic microscope so I can make those films. And uh, yeah, again, like they have the equipment sitting there and they're not using it every single day. <laughs> so I could in a summertime go over and use it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a learning process for me. Um, and I do wish I would have had more of a background, but it's, you know, a lifelong, I guess, passion. <laughs> Uh, and even now with Cura Oncology, they're basically telling me what they do and how can I make that look, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of this interesting dialogue. It's almost the cart before the horse. They've decided they want this thing <laughs> that they don't even know what it's supposed to look like. So it's an odd way to make an artwork, but yeah. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, I've got a question for you, if I could. Oh, yeah, Stanley, I, yes. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll echo what Scott said about there very, being very few uh, scientists that, 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 that interface with art, and I really appreciate that. And I'm kind of wondering, um, I, I, I'm really struck with, with some of those uh, genetic sequence images, you, you know, where the sequencing are those bars and they're mm -hmm. somewhat polarized. And in some ways, it seems like that's a, a gift from science to have such an interesting uh, design component mm -hmm. that they help you. But I'm kind of wondering how much formal art training you've had. It seems like your stuff is all coming from a scientific point of view. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have had if you had any formal art training uh, that enabled you to kind of merge these worlds. 
Yeah, I went to Carnegie Mellon um, and uh, as a high school kid, I was uh, a painter. And um, at Carnegie Mellon, I turned towards sculpture and installation and mostly worked in installation work. Um, some of my early pieces, I worked with biometric, bio, biomorphic form. Um, one installation at the Mattress Factory was my first exhibition I used to show at the AIR Gallery in New York. And um, that all of that body of work was working directly with wood and trees and drawing from them and seeing kind of their genetic or <laughs> their interesting anomalies. Um, so that early work, definitely my graduate work was at the University of Washington. I created a collector's chamber, which is um, like a wunderkammer. And I archived orchids that were on the verge of extinction. So that's when I began to kind of do more, uh, you know, the, the rhetoric of minimalism <laughs> that science, that the minimalist borrowed from, right? So I'm very steeped in the history of painting uh, and the history of sculpture slash installation. Um, the, you know, the way in which they taught at Carnegie Mellon was to, not think about art just as art, but also to reach into other fields that our lives are more circular. Um, we have at Carnegie Mellon, the studio for creative inquiry. So they were unafraid to, you know, say, go out and look at these other sorts of things, other parts of the world. Um, I think that in terms of the art world, one of some of my most influential experiences were I spent a year working for James Terrell. Um, and um, so light and space, uh, is really important to me, though I don't make that work. I do see um, the parallel, particularly with the pieces like the chromosome paintings, you know, really making lenses for light to move through. Uh, so I feel like I am borrowing uh, the piece of Shades of White with the, the boxes. I pretty much was ripping off a uh, Donald Judd. <laughs> But I was turning it on its ear. Uh, I'm, I'm very aware that that's what I'm doing. And when I was doing the portraits of myself, I know, I know those look like Rothko paintings, right? So I'm, uh, you know, I, I guess I could also give that lecture, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but then I might, I might look like I'm just borrowing from all of them. But I do like, I love the idea that sometimes scientists come up with bio infographics that look like art. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Gary, a um, uh, question from the chat. Uh, can yeah. you, it might be our last, uh, I know you have to te teach this afternoon. I do. Think about your dyeing process, the types of dye you use and any mm -hmm. metrics you use regarding color catching. Yeah, so uh, two different categories of printing. Uh, one has been electronic um, and currently, you know, Epson, uh, you can now buy cloth that goes through an Epson printer. So, you know, but for a long time, like with the early works in early 2000s, I was using a, a company called Stella Color out of Seattle. And I would go up there and calibrate with them. Um, when I was in London, I was at London Print and I started doing a lot of work with silk screens. So some of that early work is also silk screened. And um, so silk screen dyes, right? Silk screen inks. Um, the piece Shades of White is all um, barks from different like organic dyes. And uh, I, you know, to do that, I kept these crazy notebooks. I worked with a student that summer and we had a lot of fun, but it was hard to get, as you were, they were saying calibration, you know, it's kind of like with ceramics, getting the glaze to look right, <laughs> getting a dye to look right and to repeat it is really hard. <laughs> but that's again, where I see the, the connection between art and science, you know, to get really good glazes, to get really good dyes, to get really good welds in a, a, a case. <laughs> All of that takes me a long time of, you know, learning and hand learning. Yeah, so that's a, that's a short way to say time <laughs> work. <laughs> but yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, Thank, yeah. you, Mary. Thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time. I don't want you yeah. uh, too late for class. And I class in 10 minutes. Thank <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing your work. I you. sorry we could not have the exhibition for in yeah. person, but I encourage everybody to visit your website uh, to see your work and videos there. Um, thank you again, Jerry. Please do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
See you soon, I hope, someday. (laughs) 